The following podcast is from Pathway Community Church. More information about Pathway can be found at www.pathwaycc.net. Please enjoy this podcast, and we pray that God will meet you while you listen. Um, okay, so we are going to be continuing on in our study of 1 Thessalonians. So if you guys want to turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, and then once you get there, uh, please go ahead and stand up, and we will uh, honor the Word of God by standing. We're going to start in verse 13 of chapter 2. He says, For this reason we also thank God without ceasing, because when you received the word of God which you heard from us, you welcomed it not as the word of men, but as, as it is in truth, the word of God, which is also effectively works in you who believe. For you, brethren, became imitators of the churches of God, which are in Judea in Christ Jesus. For you also suffered the same things from your own countrymen, just as they did from the Jews, who killed both the Lord Jesus and their own prophets, and have persecuted us, and they do not please God, and are contrary to all men. Forbidding us to speak to the Gentiles, that they may be saved, so as always to fill up the measure of their sins, but wrath has come upon them to the uttermost." But we, brethren, having been taken away from you for a short time in presence, not in heart, endeavored more eagerly to see your face with great desire. Therefore, we wanted to come to you, even I, Paul, time and again, but Satan hindered us. For what is our hope or joy or crown of rejoicing? Is it not even you in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming? For you are our glory and joy. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for today. I pray that your presence would just be here God, we say it a lot here, and we mean it. If you're not here, it's a waste of time. So, God, I pray that your spirit would be poured out on us this morning, that your words would be spoken from this stage. Lord, that you would be glorified in our hearts, in our minds, in our words, in our actions. Lord, we just thank you so much, and we praise you for all that you've done in us. In your name, amen. So thinking about what's going on here in 1 Thessalonians God gives us help, and praise Jesus for that. We talk a lot about needing resources to do our job well. We talk a lot about, I mean, my job, a big part of my job is to equip you guys as the body of Christ to do our ministry and service well. And so we like to talk about how tools help us. And a carpenter, in the same way a carpenter wants to have the correct tools and, and the practical knowledge of how those tools help him finish a job. We also want to have practical knowledge of how the tools that God has given us work so that we can use those resources to their full capacity. If we have no idea how to use the resources that God has provided for us, then they're going to waste. I could hand you guys a chisel and you might not know what to do with it. You might know what to do with it. You might throw it at me. <laughs> And, but if you know how to use that chisel, you can make an amazing piece of handcrafted woodwork or rock work, depending on what your, what your medium is. And so we want to be able to use the tools that God has given us. And we have three tools that God has given us that we're going to be talking about today. And the first one is the word in us, but we'll get to that in just a second. One thing that we have to remember, I'm sorry guys, my notes are very scattered right now, so I'm just looking for a second. One thing that we have to remember in our life is that we, on a daily basis, are the only Christians that certain people will see. The saying goes like this, you might be the only Bible that your coworker ever reads. And the understanding of that is that how you live your life on a daily basis, how you live your life in giving the gospel and sharing Jesus Christ with others might be the only church that they get. And so how are you doing at that is the question. And if, we are un, if we're unprepared, then, then we as a church are failing and we can't hope to do what Jesus Christ has called us to do, which is to make disciples of all nations. Uh, we're to be living our lives so that people can see Jesus Christ in us. So what are some of the resources? that are in us. If you guys take notes in your bulletin, the first point that we're going to be making is the word in us. 
And verse 13, just going back to what Paul says, says, For this reason we also thank God without ceasing, because when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you welcomed it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth the word of God. There is an understanding that the gospel that Paul preached to them was not just his opinion of how he think they sh- thought they should live or words that he had made up, but that it was a message from God, that this was actually the story that God wanted to fulfill in their lives, the purpose that God wanted to fulfill in their lives. There were some that doubted Paul. There were some that thought that he was a wackadoo, I'm sure. There were people that stoned Paul, if you guys read through Acts. He did not have an easy go at this, but guys, he was preaching what God wanted him to preach, and the people who did accept it, accepted it as from the Lord. What we do is not our own opinion. Well, hopefully. There are plenty of pastors, and I should say pastors, that are eager to give you their opinion on how you should live your life, or how you should spend your money, or how you should do things. They're eager to be in the spotlight up on this stage and have the authority over you and control of their congregation. I would hope that Pastor Rob is not like that. I don't think I would be standing here if he was. Of course, some of you guys might think that I'm like that and don't want me standing up here. If that's the case, then let's have coffee. I don't want your praise. I don't want your money. I don't want anything from you guys except that you guys grow closer to the Lord. That is the biggest deal to me. I could care less if there's a thousand of us in this room or if there's 20 of us in this room as long as we are pursuing Jesus Christ and Him glorified in our lives. These men that think that they are the center of the world, or the center of the church, think that they're more important than salvation. And Paul was preaching salvation. Paul was preaching forgiveness of sins. Paul was preaching Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And there's no way, or at least there should be no way, to monopolize Jesus Christ, to to turn it into a capital venture where I am going to give you the gospel and you are going to pay me. Do you guys realize that that's literally paying for salvation? One of the things, uh, I don't know if you guys, if he was as popular up here as he at least kind of was in the States in the 80s, but Keith Green, if you guys know who the artist Keith Green is, um, it was amazing because when he was doing, he was a Christian music artist and he was a piano player that was amazing. He died in 1982 in a plane crash um, with his son and daughter, I believe. Um, and he would go to record companies before, before he passed away, and he would ask them, can I put my record in your store? And they would say, sure, you know, whatever, here's some, some shelf space or whatever they had. And they would say, how much do you want us to charge for this album? And he would say, nothing. And they would say, what do you mean, nothing? And he said, well, my albums are giving the gospel of Jesus. How could I charge anybody to give them the gospel? We get the gospel for free. And I think that Paul was saying here that, look, we aren't looking for anything except for your growth in Jesus Christ. It's the word of God, which also effectively works in you who believes. It's so important that we understand and believe that the word of God works in us. It's a living book that is active in our lives. It is actively changing us. And even Hebrews 4.12 says this. It says, For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit, of joints and marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. Okay, so sharp sword pierces further than just physical bone. It pierces to the soul and spirit and intentions and heart. It knows the intentions, guys, of our heart, and it'll expose them to us. When we, as we read the Word of God, as we learn how to use this tool, as we learn how to exercise the, the resource that we have, guys, it changes us. A lot of you guys probably read the Bible on a yearly basis. If you do that, good job. Like doing, doing the Bible in a year program is fantastic. Some of you guys are thinking to yourself, I can read like a chapter in a year. That's okay too. As long as this word is working in you and actively cutting you. It doesn't necessarily have to feel good to change. 
But this word of God changes us. It has an effect on us. It brings us to a point of understanding that we aren't the center of the world, that everything I do should be glorifying Jesus Christ. Everything that I do in word and in deed should be to the glory of Jesus Christ. And so how are we doing at that? Sometimes we really suck at it. Sometimes we do okay. Other times we really need help. And that's okay. It's the ebb and flow, guys. And we're not going to be perfect here on this earth. At least I'm not going to be. You guys might have it figured out, but I do not. And so, guys, diving into this word is our biggest resource. It's our biggest tool that God has given us so that we can grow closer to him and so that we can effectively make disciples of others. And so we want to be living that life that way. When we start to look at the, word, at the Bible as an active resource in our life, we will experience God in whole new ways. God is amazing how he loves us, how he cares for us, how he shows us grace and mercy and kindness and gentleness and all of those fruit of the spirit things. Guys, he loves us so much and we should be loving others as well. And when we dive into his word, we understand that a little bit better. We are told to hide scripture in our hearts in Psalm 119 verse 11. And that's so that we will not sin against God. His word is to dwell which means active living, in our hearts, Colossians 3.16. Allowing God's word to change how we think and act will allow us to minister to others around us better. And that's why we're here, guys. We're here to be a light to the world. We're here to make disciples. We're, yes, we're here to glorify God. Yes, we're here to worship him. Yes, we are made for worship, as the Chris Tomlin song says. We are made for worshiping him. That is truth. We're also here to make disciples so that more people can worship him. We're here to make sure that we are growing closer to him so that not one person passes away and goes to hell. Not one person in our midst doesn't know the truth. But to know the truth, we have to study the truth. And the word of God is our truth. He tells us how to live, so we should desire to listen and follow Secondly, and we're moving quickly today. Sorry, it's partly that I'm sick. Secondly, in verse 14 through 16, he talks about the people around us. So let's just go ahead and read those verses as well. It says, For you, brethren, became imitators of the churches of God, which are in Judea in Christ Jesus. For you also suffered the same things from your own countrymen, just as they did from the Jews, who killed both the Lord Jesus and their own prophets, and having persecuted us, and they do not please God and are contrary to all men, forbidding us to speak to the Gentiles that they may be saved, so as always to fill up the measure of their sins, but wrath has come upon them to the uttermost. There's something to be said for trying to imitate someone that you admire. Some of us like to imitate superheroes that we see in the movies, and we talked about that over the summer. Um, some of us like to imitate uh, Jesus, if we're super spiritual, we'll say Jesus. Some of us like to imitate our parents. Some of us like to imitate our friends. Some of us just like to imitate the person that's next to us, <laughs> regardless of who it is at any given time. But someone that you admire is someone that you want to be like that. We like to think that we are all individuals, and that's not a bad thing, but Christ has set an example for us to follow, and it is not bad to try and be Christ-like. We, we live in a society, and I've, I've said this a lot, and you guys may have heard me say this, I feel like there's a new generational push right now to see how close we can be like the world as Christians and still be Christians. Like if we have the line right here, here's the line of the world, and on the other side of that is being a non-Christian. It's just being, living for yourself, doing what feels good, all those things. As a generation, I feel like, and, and I could be wrong, and this is definitely a blanket statement, just understand, I'm saying it from my perspective, I feel like we're getting closer and closer to that line to see, see, it's cool to be a Christian. Yeah, I do these things, but I still love Jesus, and he forgives me for it. Or, yeah, I do these things, and God understands because he's cool like that. And I think to myself, how, how often do you read about a Billy Graham or someone that's been very effective for Jesus Christ, how often do you see them straddling that line? They don't, guys. P 
People that want to be Christ-like are turning away from that line and running as far as they can away from it. So how are we spending our times? Who, who are we wanting to imitate? Because if we're wanting to imitate the world and be a quote-unquote cool Christian, guys, I never want anybody to call me a cool Christian because that means I'm kind of flirting with that line. I want people to think, wow, you are so different from what the world is. I like that. And guys, we've, we've convinced ourselves, though, that the closer we get to that line, the more relatable we can become, and the more relevant we become, and the more whatever, and we're going to reach this certain generation because we get close to this line, and we have, you know, secular music in our worship times, or whatever it is. I, I don't know. But instead of that, we should be running as far as we can away from that into the arms of Jesus Christ. We are hopefully in this room a body of believers who desires to be more and more like Christ. We are a family, we use that word a lot here, we are a family that will hold each other accountable to the Word of God and who we claim to be. We have baptisms here. Actually, uh, Bergtaller just did a baptism this morning. We did ours in June. Um, we have baptisms here, and what that is is a public declaration of, guys, I'm joining the family. Part of what joining the family means is that I want you to keep me accountable to who I'm saying I'm going to be. As my brothers and sisters in Christ, if I was doing something that was totally sinful and wrong, I would want you guys to come and approach me and ask me, hey, how are you doing? Do we need to talk about this? As my brothers and sisters in Christ, I will get mad at you for daring thinking that you have any say in what I do with my life. <laughs> but I'll be wrong. And I'm okay with that. And you should be okay with that. Guys, we, we live our lives according to what we think is right, but guys, what I'm, what I'm trying to say is what we think is right doesn't matter. What this says is right is what matters in our life. What this says is right to do is what we should be doing. And well, it's a gray area. Is it though? Well, I don't know if the Bible talks about it. Doesn't it though? Well, you can't judge me. The Bible says don't judge. You're my brother in Christ and I don't want to see you going down a path that you shouldn't be going down. The Bible gives me a right. God gives me a right to come into your life and speak truth in love. And, and you can ask my wife and you can ask Rob about this. I'm really, really good at speaking truth. Period. <laughs> I'm really, really bad at speaking truth in love. And so I'm working on the in love part. And so that's something that my wife and Rob and people that I trust come into my life and they say, hey, are you thinking about it like in love or are you just thinking beat them over the head with a stick? And I have to roll my eyes and say, shut up. <laughs> because I don't want to change. So guys, when, when someone calls you up and says, hey brother, I noticed that you know, you're struggling with this, or uh, you said this, or what did you mean by that? Instead of getting our hackle up and getting all angry and defensive, maybe we should just self-examine ourselves and, and we have a core value here that says choose trust. Maybe we should choose trust that that person is trying to help us not trying to be better than or more, more holy than or more pious than or whatever else because we can get defensive very, very quick. And guys, it just turns into sin. That's the truth of it. Our brothers and sisters are, help, are there to help us get through hard times. Weep with those who weep and rejoice with those who rejoice, right? They are there to encourage us to continue on in our race. God has put them in our lives to sharpen each other as iron sharpens iron. Proverbs 27, 17 says, Iron sharpens iron, and one man sharpens another. If you've ever sharpened a blade, which I'm sure that everyone in this room has for sure done that, <laughs> if you've ever sharpened a blade, it's a rock that scrapes off parts of the iron to make it sharper to get that edge. It hurts. It stinks. It's not fun. But guys, it's so important to our growth. 
And when we encourage one another towards Jesus Christ, sometimes we don't want to change. We don't think that that thing in our life is that big of a deal. We don't think that that sin in our life, God, God, Jesus died on the cross so that I could do this. Actually, he died on the cross so you could be free from doing that. You don't have to do the things that the world tells you you have to do. And in this room, of all places, on a Sunday morning, we should feel the safety and the comfort to be able to say, I didn't do good, I want to do better. With no judgment, guys. There is no judgment on our part. We're to be kind to one another, Ephesians 4.32, and we're to forgive one another. When we do this, then the world sees a successful body of believers that truly believes that we are to love our neighbor as ourselves. Guys, the most scathing quote about Christianity that I've heard in a very long time, and I don't hear it very often anymore, maybe it's just the cultures that I'm surrounding myself with or whatever else, but it used to be, Christians are the only army that will shoot their wounded in the back. When we come to one another and we have broken hearts because we sin or whatever else, we say, you dirty sinner, how could you do this? I'm glad I'm not like you. We are here to forgive one another. We're here to love one another. We're here to encourage one another. And praise Jesus that I think in this body we have a pretty good health about that. I I don't doubt that we do that pretty well. But what I'm saying is that we can do even better. And not only that, when we do it, we show the world that's watching that we actually do care for one another. It's interesting because if you guys remember a a couple of months back, um, one of the worship leaders from Hillsong Uh, came out and said he was done with Jesus. Um, He said he couldn't believe in God, there wasn't enough evidence, all these things. And I watched that, I watched that exchange happen. And you know what the Christians did? We all gave him a nice, hard, solid kick on his way out the door. Like, it was like, good riddance, you've hurt so many people, can't believe you would do this to us, all these things, we're so brokenhearted because of how you're treating us, all these things. We didn't really show, and I say again, blanket statement, but we didn't, as a collective group, show him a lot of our support. Fast forward to this last week, Kanye West came out with an album. I don't know if you guys have heard of this. Um, I've, that album is be, it has been on loop in my car for a while, um, ever since it came out. But it's interesting because he came to Jesus and accepted Jesus Christ, made an album about Jesus Christ that's very convicting if you're a Christian, And the Christians were sitting there tearing him apart because, oh, well, he doesn't really mean it. Or better be careful because we don't know if he's going to turn around and not do what are his intentions, all these things. It's like, guys, heaven is throwing a party because a lost soul has been saved. Since the 80s, when I was a kid, we grew up praying that famous people would come to Jesus so that they could have a have a platform to affect the more famous people and more people. Someone finally came to Jesus, and what are we doing? (laughs) We're tearing him down because we don't trust that he's really saved. Shame on us as Christians for doing that. Guys, we rip each other apart because your faith doesn't look like my faith. You're not the same kind of Christian as I am, and that's not okay, guys. We need to be growing closer to Jesus Christ, and we need to be keeping each other accountable, and we need to be pointing each other towards Jesus Christ, but we need to be doing all of that in love. And we need to have a lot of patience with baby Christians. We need to have a lot of patience with people that we don't agree with. There is plenty of people that think, I have no right to be standing before you. Um, because of the way I dress, because of the tattoos on my body, because of whatever you think, because I'm an American and you're Canadian, like, we just don't get along, which isn't true anymore. 1812, you guys whooped us and we, we agree, like, it's fine now. We'll just make you, make you our ally and move on and ignore the fact that you whooped us. <laughs> but guys, Whether or not you think I should be up here, if you want to talk about that, great. I would love to have a conversation with you about that. But we're going to do it in love. We're going to do it in a way where you and I can actually have a conversation across the table from one another and agree with one another that we both love Jesus. We just might disagree on whether it's okay to have tattoos. And I'm okay with that. I really am. 
It is not a salvific issue, in my opinion, and we can talk about that if you want to. We have an amazing resource in the body when we truly trust and love one another. And another thing about that is it's not just one man. It's not just about the pastor that's standing before you. It's the entire group of believers pressing each other towards the prize of Jesus Christ. Paul talks about the race that we're in being a a race for the prize, and we want to be racing towards that. And I want you guys to hope that I finish first, and I want to hope that you guys finish first. And I don't mean dead first. I mean, you guys can hope that I die. It's okay. I'm okay with that. But guys, I want to achieve the prize. I want to, I want to when I die, I want Jesus to be thrilled to death to see me and said, you did everything I asked you to do. Enter into your rest. And I want to earn that word. I want to earn that word, rest, while I'm here. You can sleep when you're dead is the saying that goes around a lot. Okay, moving on. we got to move on. Um, thirdly and finally, the glory set before us. Verses 17 to 20. And I'm just going to skip to verse 19, actually. It says, For what is our hope or joy or crown of rejoicing? Is it not even you in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming? For you are our glory and joy. Paul puts it fairly plainly that our glory is in us. And what I mean is in us as a body. It is not even, is it not even you in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ? That is our glory. Our glory is to see the people that we have shared the gospel with and accepted to be standing next to Christ in heaven. I hope that when I get to heaven, there's a bunch of people there that are like, if it hadn't been for you and your super awesome flannels, I wouldn't be standing here today. And yes, flannels do have... Do you know how many people have noticed that I'm wearing a different flannel today? Like 40. If you don't, if you don't think that that's an opportunity for me to share the gospel, then you are foolish. All right. So listen, guys, what we do and how we act is is definitely towards that purpose of seeing more people become disciples of Jesus Christ. We want to see more people coming under the fold. We want to see and it's not about butts and seats. Don't hear me saying that all we want to do is fill this sanctuary because that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is I want to see people that are growing closer to Jesus Christ. And you guys have heard me say it before and I'll say it again. If that's a pathway, praise Jesus, tithe, and I'll be happy. If it's not at pathway, that's fine. You should still tithe to pathway. I'm okay with other people getting the people. I'm okay with other churches getting the people in their seats as long as two things are happening. One, the Word of God needs to be being preached. If you can have a good Bible teaching church, then go there. And two, you need to feel like you can serve there. 110%, you are all in. You are ready to do whatever this church is doing because you believe in their mission. You believe in their vision. You believe in what's going on. If you can do those two things, if that church has those two things, and personally, and I know I'm a little biased because I'm on the payroll, I believe we are doing those two things here at Pathway. But if those two things are things that you can get behind, then praise God, go and be blessed. We want to do that because people getting out of hell is the most important thing. And here's the thing, guys, is I want you guys to think for... 10 seconds. We're going to count to 10. Starting now. Okay, that's about 10 seconds. Do you realize how many thousands of people just went to hell in those 10 seconds? Guys, people are dying every two seconds. Every two seconds, somebody dies. And you know, the likelihood of that person going to heaven, look, I don't have any statistic because I haven't been to heaven and I don't have the numbers from Jesus. But here's the thing that Jesus did say is, wide is the path that leads to destruction and many go down it. That should give us all shivers down our spines. That should give us all a reason to go out and talk to that person that we know doesn't love Jesus Christ and try and get them. 
because that person spending an eternity in hell, I don't care who it is. You can think of the most terrible person in your head, that person that steals your food at lunch every Monday morning. You just know they're going to take it, and you write your name on it, and they take it anyway, and then they they leave a half-eaten sandwich and a half cup of applesauce. That person doesn't deserve to go to hell. No one, well, okay, (laughs) everyone deserves to go to hell. But praise Jesus that he died on the cross so we wouldn't have to. And it's a good saying and it's truth. God doesn't send anybody to hell. People choose to go there. And so, guys, we, we are the mouthpiece of Jesus Christ. We have the opportunity to give the gospel. We have the opportunity to try and turn people away from this fate. Hell is uncomfortable. I'm sorry if, it, if you guys are getting a little twitchy in your seats. Maybe you need to hear this. But guys, hell is not something we should just be flippant about. We shouldn't just say, ah, that's their problem, or it's the pastor's problem, or it's the whatever. It's, it's not my problem. Yes, it is, guys. As Jesus Christ's children, we have a duty to be giving the gospel. We have a purpose of why we're here. People going to heaven, yes, it's good. And I I would love, like I said, I want to see droves of people that are in heaven because of, you know, words that I've said or whatever else. It's not me, though, who saves them. All I can do is give the gospel. I can plant the seed. What they do with it is their problem. At that point, it becomes, I've done my duty. (laughs) Duty. Guys, at that point, it becomes a, I'm okay with saying, look, I've done what I can do. And I've given you guys this example before. My brother is a good example. I've given him the gospel. I've done what I can. I will not be the person that leads my brother to Jesus. There's just, he knows too much of my, he's my big brother. Like, I'm the little kid that he used to beat up on. And spit, and he would pin me down and spit in my face and stuff. It's just the worst. So, like, I won't be the person to lead him to Jesus, but guess what? He knows about Jesus because of me. Now I let God do the work. I'm okay with that. We cannot force people to love Jesus. So, where are you? Are you a person that's sitting here right now? And I'm going to have the prayer team come up right now. Are you a person here right now that is not following Jesus at all? If you are, let me tell you this. Sin is real. God is real. There is a consequence for how we live our lives here on this earth. The reason why Jesus Christ came and to die on the cross, the reason why we have crosses that you can't really see up on the back wall is because Jesus died and we want to remember that he died for us. He died for a reason and that reason was so that your sins, past, present, and future could be paid for. Regardless of what you've done, it doesn't matter. I hear this a lot with the older generation of people is, well, you don't know what I've done or I'm too far gone or it's been too long of a life and there's just no hope for me. Guys, there is always hope for you. There is nothing that you can have done that will turn Jesus' back on you. There's one unforgivable sin, and that's the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, and none of you guys are dead in this room, so none of you guys have committed that sin yet. So please understand that the reason why God loves you so much is because he created you and he wants to be with you. He desires you. He's ecstatic about you. He just wants you to accept him and love him. And, and guys, with this book, it's daunting, but you guys are here in this room anyway. You guys are here learning about how God wants you to live, so continue down that path. That's all it is. He doesn't ask you to be perfect and then come to him. He doesn't ask you to get things figured out and then accept his love and grace and forgiveness. He just says, come as you are, be forgiven, I will love you. Let him love you. 
Maybe you're that person. Maybe you're a person sitting here thinking, well, you know what? I just don't think I have it all figured out, and I don't think that it's my job to open my mouth. It's, you know, God hasn't put that on my heart to do that. Let me tell you two things. One, nope, I'm not going to say it. I'm going to bite my tongue. (laughs) Rob just gave me the good job. (laughs) Let me tell you one thing about that, guys. We all have the command to go and make disciples. We all have that, those marching orders have been given to every single one of us in this room. If you accept Jesus, if you love Jesus, if you are a child of God, then you have that as your marching orders to make disciples. It's not a suggestion. It's not a maybe you should think about it. It's a go and do. And that's why we're here. You guys get why we have a prayer team. The prayer team is here for people that are broken, for people that are hurting, for people that are rejoicing, for people that need Jesus, for people that have Jesus and want to just refresh things. That's why we stand up here every week to pray with you guys. So don't be afraid. And I'm going to ask, we're going to pray here now. So guys, everybody just close your eyes, bow your head, fold your hands, get on your knees, lay prostrate before the Lord, whatever you need to do. But we're going to pray for a second, and I'm going to invite people that are uncomfortable to come forward. I'm going to invite people that maybe wouldn't normally do this to come forward. And I feel like, guys, we have this understanding in our culture that the further back that we sit, the safer we are. So I'm specifically looking at you, balcony people. (laughs) Guys, it's okay. Nobody is going to throw tomatoes at you as you come forward. Nobody is going to whisper, oh, look at so-and-so. I can't believe that they would need prayer. Guys, we love you so much, and God loves you so much, and he loves you too much to leave you sitting in that chair the way you are right now. He wants you. He wants all of you. He wants you to give all of yourself to him. Jesus, thank you so much for who you are. Thank you for loving us. I pray, God, that you would work in our midst, that we would see who you are more clearly. God, for those people who are wondering who you are, that they don't know, that they aren't sure, I pray that you would give them boldness to just pray in their hearts right now, God, forgive me, and show me how to walk this life. Your word says that it is a light to our path. God, that it will guide us through life. We don't have to have all of the answers. All we have to know is that we love you and we don't want to die without you in our hearts. God, thank you that you've answered that question. Thank you that we can have the confidence to know that if we take our last breath right now and we have you in our hearts, that we will be taking our first breath in heaven. God, that the glory of Jesus will just be in our midst, that we would experience you in a more full way than we've ever experienced you before. God, thank you for that. God, I pray for the people who are hesitant right now to think that maybe I'm okay, but maybe I'm not. God, I pray that you would give them the courage to pray the prayer, (laughs) That that they would come to you and that they would ask you genuinely, how am I doing? Am I okay? What do I need to change? What do I need to do? And God, your word makes it very, very simple. Confess your sins and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. God, thank you that you've made it simple. I pray that we wouldn't complicate things. I pray that we wouldn't try and make them more than, that we wouldn't be worried about what other people will think that, God, you would work in our lives to change us into someone who is not just trying to be like the world and trying to be like Jesus, but, Lord, that we would just press into the understanding that being like Jesus is more than enough. Being like you is all that we ever could hope for. God, I pray that if there is needs in this body right now, if there's hurts, if there's pains, if there's needing for rejoicing because things are going so well, 
God, I pray that these people would come forward even now. Lord, that you would get them out and that they would come forward and pray. Lord, that they would pray to be closer to you, that they would be pray to be closer in fellowship with one another. God, thank you that you've given us a family. Thank you that you've given us people that can keep us accountable. And I pray for every single one of us in this room who has been baptized publicly that we would understand that that is a public acknowledgement that we are going to live our lives according to your word, not according to our opinion. Lord, and that if we haven't been doing that, that there's no judgment, there's no condemnation, we just need to change. Thank you, God for loving us so much. Thank you for being here with us. We praise you and thank you and thank you and thank you. We love you, Lord. In your name, amen.